Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. I have been working in the industry since 2001. I started as an intern. I did uh, simultaneous summer internships at Event Magazine and Subterrain Magazine. And since then I have worked as a volunteer in addition to managing volunteers and all those other wonderful things. In 2013, I completed my term as board president of the Magazine Association of British Columbia on the board where I had the challenge and pleasure of pulling really high-level work out of incredibly busy, stressed people, uh, editors, owners, and publishers. Most recently, I have changed hats a little bit and work as a personal trainer and a fitness instructor. So uh, there's an interesting overlap there in that I've gotten uh, even better at helping people understand what they need to do for their own good and then convincing them that it's going to be uh, enjoyable to do that. So my goal today is to share with you some of the most recent research shared by volunteers themselves uh, in terms of what they find rewarding and satisfying about volunteering, and then to give you hopefully at least a couple of ideas to take back to your office with you so that you can either improve or really in some ways begin a better HR process for all of your staff, paid and unpaid. Let's talk about that relationship a little bit deeper. What we're always dealing with is what you want from your staff versus what they want. So what you want is fairly simple. You want consistency. You're looking for someone who's literally going to show up relatively on time and perform the tasks that you've asked them to do. They're gonna be reliable, they're gonna understand what their role is, and they're gonna do it. You're looking for competency, so you're hoping that the person who's doing their best at their job is actually doing their best well enough to take that load off of your shoulders uh, rather than adding to your workload in terms of having to manage someone through every step of the process. And lastly, you might not know that you're looking for this, but you should be looking for some fresh thinking. It's very easy to think of your staff as a pool of labor, a group of people upon whom you enforce tasks. But new staff, and dare I say it, younger staff, are there to bring new ideas and freshness to your publication and to be a talent pool to draw from rather than just to send orders to. Now, a lot of finding this ideal candidate uh, is going to depend on the people that you interview and it's also going to depend on how well you choose in the interview process. But even the best person with all of these talents will fail if you don't know what to do with them. There is a certain problem that happens, I see a lot in literary magazines especially, or cultural magazines, where one feels compelled to keep bringing in new volunteers. We need more help, we need more help, things are piling up, who's going to read the slush pile? And then there are people who have started to grow cobwebs over them in corners and collect dust because they're not being used effectively. So it's always good to take a step back and ask, are we even using the people in our office to their fullest uh, potential before we go casting out for new people that we have to train from level zero? So when you know what you need, uh, and that's a process that involves taking a look at your current staff as well as your production schedule. You really want to look at the resources you already have, look at your publication schedule, sort of address any bottlenecks. Where are you falling short? Where do you have to keep struggling in your schedule? And figure out what those problems are and how you need to convert those needs like, oh my God, we need someone to read the slush pile into an actual job description or a responsibility. When you make a job description, and this is fairly straightforward for those of you working in larger organizations, I'm sure you already have job descriptions in place. It's less obvious for smaller operations, and I think that's because we do tend to wear so many hats. If you've ever uh, been a volunteer at a publication and someone calls and like asks for your editorial department or your circulation department, you're just like, <laughs> that's adorable that you think we have that. That's so cute. <laughs> or someone calls looking for an editing job and you're like, yeah, we all want that job, uh, but I've, somebody's got to stuff these envelopes. But it is important to make a job description and it results in when you hire people, they actually know what their responsibilities are. It also creates 
a sense of realness about the job that a lot of uh, interns and unpaid staff don't necessarily get that very clear structure. So it's important to treat it just like a regular paid gig. Obviously, things in your job description should include, you know, the title of the job, the length of the term. Sometimes that's predetermined if it's a summer practicum student, for example. Other times it's up to you. Hours, their schedule, where they're going to be performing the work, if any of it's going to be done at home, what the tasks are of the job, who and when and how they're expected to report to people and then what they will get in return. So whether there is uh, an honorarium component or some pay, or if not, what you are going to provide as the employer in terms of mentorship, experience, uh, things that look great on their LinkedIn profile. And that again cycles back to who do they, who do they answer to? Do they have an immediate supervisor? Do they have, is there a hierarchy? That should be in the job description. Once you've found this wonderful individual who has all these talents and fits the job description, then it's time to set up that working relationship. And this is the time to introduce an employment agreement. Again, something that is not necessarily a given in a lot of smaller organizations. Once you've confirmed all the things in the job description, you just lay that out in the employment agreement. It doesn't have to be an enormous document, but it should have that information in it. It should also cover your responsibilities in terms of giving the employee meaningful work and feedback and when. And it also should outline what is expected of the employee, not just in terms of the actual job description, but also any uh, policies you have around non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality, things like that, as well as supporting the mission of the magazine. That's a good time to bring that in. And of course, creating a culture of you know respect and contracts, anything like that. And then you sit down with that person and you agree upon those things, you go over that document together and then you both sign it. This is a useful moment for two reasons. One is that it cements that relationship, it makes it very clear, and it signals the beginning of employment. It's very easy to just have someone kind of come in every Tuesday afternoon and like do some stuff and leave. But if you create a, a real document, that person has a sense of responsibility and obligation and so do you. And that you'll get a lot more out of that relationship if you have this in place. Secondly, if anything should go wrong in that relationship, you have a document to fall back on. So if there's a complaint later or some kind of workplace conflict, someone feels like their end of the bargain is not being held up, you can refer back to that document together. So it's a very, very useful thing to have. An internship really is a trade-off. You're getting someone for free to work for you or for a very limited uh, amount of money and in return they're getting something from you that may not be money. So in the case of a three-month uh, practicum for example, that you really have to break into two chunks. So in this case in a three-month, the first six weeks is really about you giving them guidance and shaping you know, what their day is going to look like and offering them those, those meaningful assignments very gradually. After about six weeks, you get to let go of the reins a little bit and the intern or the student begins to deliver on their promise. They feel more comfortable in that office environment, they know how to work the photocopier, you know, they maybe have a key, all those like things that take forever to figure out and feel comfortable, now they can start rewarding you. But you have to remember that the first few weeks when someone's there, it is going to be more work for you. I think a lot of us want to bring in someone because we want to take the workload off of us and that's all well and good. But if you're not willing to invest in that initial little bit of hand holding and gradually allowing people to take on more responsibility, then you will be kind of half acidly managing them for the entire internship and then no one really benefits. So we know what you want and we've found this person. And now we have to find out what they want. Well, they usually want some money <laughs> and they usually want some professional or personal development or both. Now, because most of us aren't offering great big bags of money, it becomes really important that we focus on that growth and development aspect. And that's what we're going to get into now. What our interns want from us and what we can do to give it to them. 
Earlier this year, a UK volunteer management group called Making Time uh, released a really interesting study along with a matrix called the Givers Model. And they interviewed volunteers from all different industries, but in particular, they talked to a lot of people who volunteered at the uh, London Olympics. And what they came up with is this matrix that ag addresses this idea of personal development for volunteers and what in the real world they found rewarding and useful. So we're gonna get into these points a little deeper, but here they are initially. The first one is growth. So they always wanna be learning something. They want to have an impact. They wanna feel like they're a part of something great. And that, of course, in this case, is your magazine. Voice is something we always think about like, oh, they're the voice of an organization. That's not what this means here. It literally means the way in which they are spoken to, the words and the type of language and the tone that you use when speaking to your staff. They want experience, they want real challenges, they want real growth. They don't wanna be just stuffing envelopes, even if stuffing envelopes is a part of their job description. They want to not only have those experiences and challenges, but they also want to be recognized for those experiences and challenges. And lastly, they want to feel like they're a part of a team. They want to have a social interaction with their coworkers, with you. They want to feel like they're a part of a culture. And in this case, that's really about you creating that office culture. So let's explore each of these uh, in a little more depth with actual tips on how you can provide these things. Growth. In short-term internships, uh, growth is a pretty easy thing to give people. In those first few weeks, learning how to use the photocopier, learning how to direct phone calls, learning how to run the finicky coffee maker is a growth experience. But beyond that, uh, it becomes a little bit more challenging to figure out how, as a small operation, you can offer growth opportunities. One magazine I know that's a bit of a larger operation holds their own publishing classes. So they take a few times a year, they, they put together a, an after work session on a, a topic of interest such as copy editing or you know something related to production. And they either bring somebody in or a senior staff member presents that. So it's uh, an opportunity for uh, the junior staff to see the level of experience in the senior staff and to learn how to do new things. If you're not able to do that in a smaller operation or in addition to doing that, you can also give uh, your volunteers access to other formal training opportunities. Any kind of provincial or uh, local relevant uh, organization that offers courses, things like Vantage Point, which offer you know, volunteer leadership kind of training. Uh, there are so many, you know, Magazines Canada, all these different organizations. So make a budget, make an opportunity for your junior staff and your interns to take advantage of those. And lastly, give them some cool, fun stuff to do. Even if the job is really sort of gritty and just kind of stuffing envelopes or reading the slush pile, which are all really fun things to do, actually, if in a nice office culture, but you want to have something that a person can walk away in three or six months and say, I did this, or I made this, and have that pride. If you don't give people that, you're gonna experience a lot more burnout, you're gonna experience a lot more staff turnover, so try and give them a nice mix of the grunt work with the, with the more toothsome activities. The second thing your volunteer staff want is to make an impact. Paid or unpaid, they want to know they're part of something important. It's thrilling for new staff to be a part of media. They've, they've entered this world that's really exciting to them, and you don't want to dampen that enthusiasm. You want to stay true to your mission because that's why they came to you. So. It just as an aside, I've always loved magazines, always loved them. The first magazine I bought, I bought in grade three with money that I stole from my mother's purse. 
And she found out and we didn't go on holiday that year because I stole. So I really don't like stealing, but, I, but it didn't dampen my enthusiasm of magazines. And then I can remember this, the magazine that I bought, the first thing that I bought where I didn't have to steal money. I was 10 years old and I bought the uh, 1981 September College Women issue of Glamour magazine with Brooke Shields on the cover. So it's a thing, right? And then when I got uh, into... Uh, uh, school and I was learning about writing and editing, I was just blown away by the diversity of magazines in this province and stuff I'd never heard of, like little cool magazines that I just thought, this is amazing. And that's, I think I'm not alone in that feeling. That's what's brought a lot of us here. So you want to um, reaffirm that excitement. You want to celebrate that in your magazine. You want to celebrate each issue and every great milestone that, that you achieve. You want to um, let them know that their role is important and valuable in creating that and sustaining that mission. And you want to use them a little bit. You want them to feel evangelical about your publication and you want them to share that enthusiasm in ever widening ripples throughout their social circle because that is not only where your readers are but it's also where maybe future volunteers are. So you just want them to just be so excited about what they do that they go out and tell everybody about it. The next thing volunteers want is something called voice. What this means here is the way that you ask people to contribute, the way that you ask people to get involved. The researchers who came up with the giver's model addressed sort of four specific types of wordings and, and energy that, uh, that really compelled people to get involved. The first one is, we need you. Your, your voice is needed in our work of culture building. We, we need your help to sustain what we do. The next one is, you belong here. This is a place for you. We're a team and you need to be a part of this team and we're gonna make this happen. The next one is a bit of a challenge. It's, have you got what it takes? The publishing industry is greedy and tough. Do you have the guts to handle it? Uh, come and prove yourself with us. And lastly, a little bit of peer pressure. People, the cool people are over here. All your friends are over here. You want to be on board with this because this is pretty much where all the neatest stuff is happening. Those four things are never things that you have to say in exactly that way, although there may be an opportunity for you to do that. But keep those kinds of messages in mind uh, when you're communicating with your team and when you're recruiting because it really does, it's, they've proven that those are the things that, that compel people to get on board. Of course, your volunteers want experience. How many here are familiar with the Google 80-20 rule? Kind of an infamous thing, yes. So employee policy is at Google that you spend 80% of your time at work on your job description, and then you spend 20% of your time on your creative pet projects, your own personal interests that hopefully in some way relate to the kinds of things that you're doing at work. So, you know, maybe your sticker collection wouldn't count, but developing a new app might. That kind of 80-20 workplace is a really extraordinary opportunity to find out what people are excited about and what they're really fantastic at. You know, you might have someone in who's, you know, just learning the basics of production and layout and then it turns out that they've just got like a wicked eye for ad design. Never miss an opportunity to let people really wow you with their surprise greatness. For me, it was a writing gig. The very first thing that I ever wrote that appeared in a non-student publication was this little half-page thing about an art project in the downtown east side that I had to sort of cobble together with a quick phone interview and then a couple of like sketchy press releases and I just labored over this thing because I was like oh my god it's the, my first writing thing and it was just this little kind of th in the context of the magazine as a whole it was not a big deal but gosh it just felt like such a big deal to me and it was so exciting when I finally got to see that in print. When you find those things that people love to do and that they're excited about doing over and above their job description, be present, be there to offer uh, support and direction and guidance. Maybe somebody would be a great candidate to go to a part-time course or something and you can help facilitate that for them to really get them uh, up to speed on what their talents already are pointing them in the direction of. Your 
Volunteers and interns also want to be recognized for all of those things. As I mentioned at the start of today's session, I am, uh, my other hat is a, as a fitness trainer and a, and a bodybuilder. And one of the most notable qualities about that industry is coming out of magazines and just seeing everybody just be like, yeah, all the time with everyone. There's just so much high-fiving and so much fist pumping and so much way to go and flexing and yeah, check this out. And everyone is very excited about how everyone is doing. And it's really rewarding. Uh, it's necessary in sport uh, of those nature to get people really pumped up and excited about what they're doing. And in your office, you don't necessarily need to be you know, running around with a cowbell and yelling, way to go, but you do want to find a way to, to be excited and recognize people that fits your office culture. That can be so simple uh, and it's better to do a little bit frequently than it is to make a big production out of it once in a blue moon. If any of you have ever been at a holiday party for a large corporate organization, and you know, by on your own or with a with a, a partner, and the CEO gets up and does this really boring speech, and everything, like, yeah. and then they do the presentation of the like awards for you know, oh Joe Blow, 20 years, and like, uh, Joe kind of makes his way you know to the stage and gets his stupid pin or whatever, and it's it's an ordeal, right, to sit through, and maybe it's not an ordeal for the people who got the pin, but it kind of never seems as exciting as it should be, and I think you know we tend to think of those things as the way that we recognize people but the way that you really recognize Joe Blow for 20 years of service is by talking to him every day or frequently at least and being like great job on that project you know way to go a couple pats on the back here and there and when somebody does something really awesome you want to let other people know in the office you want to shout that you want to you want to Instagram that shit you want to tell people about it like you saved us so much time and money you're awesome so really really recognize that positive recognition ranks as highly as pay in studies of what employees want in the workplace positive recognition ranks as highly as pay in studies of what employees want that's huge so the value on that is equal to or more than money. So we often sort of bemoan, oh, you know, what can we do if we can't pay people? Tell them that you care. Tell them that you appreciate what they do. It will keep them there. It will keep them happy. It's a magical thing. So yeah, acknowledging daily contributions, obviously, calling out those extra achievements. Make sure they get the issue, for heaven's sakes. Make sure everybody in your staff, especially your interns, not only gets a copy of the issue, but gets like five more to hand out to their family and friends. You know you've got boxes of magazines kicking around from like three years ago that you don't know what to do with. Th don't throw another log on the fire. Give those away to your people. Uh, and make sure that you're putting them literally in the masthead. Uh, even if they're just there for three months, if an issue comes out while somebody's in there, you get them in there so that they can see their name in print and really feel like they're a part of something. The last thing that we're gonna talk about in that growth givers model is the social aspect. Being around other people is a big part of that experience for your interns and your staff. And let's face it, even for those of us who are working full-time or part-time in the industry. Our office is where we spend the bulk of our waking hours. It doesn't mean that your office environment has to be like 24-hour party people, although that's nice, but it does mean that if your workplace feels like a team and is at least occasionally uh, engaging in something fun, then more people are gonna wanna be on board with that, they're gonna wanna pull together, and they're gonna wanna stay there. Your corporate culture, starts with you. So for those of you who are heading up your HR department or are at a higher level in your magazine, know that you are the person who sets the tone for the entire office. You are the voice of your organization. The behavior that you exhibit in the office as well as the behavior that you tolerate from others is what creates your corporate culture. So it doesn't have to be a party, but it does have to be respectful. It has to be open. It has to be focused on teamwork and that overall sense that you as a leader encourage development 
rather than being threatened by it. And I think that's a, I'm gonna just be honest, I think that's a real problem in our industry. People get very protective of their publications and understandably a lot of these publications have been built from the ground up with like literal blood, sweat and tears. And when new people come in, a lot of people in leadership roles, they want the help, but they don't wanna feel like anything's being taken away from them. And it's really important to be able to loosen those straps a little bit and allow energy and, and new information and new talent to flow upwards rather than being backing away from that. Celebrate achievements as a new team. So when an issue comes out, do something. When you get a big grant, do something. You know, when you hit a new circulation high or an ad sales high, do something about it. Again, it doesn't have to be huge, but acknowledge it. And of course, once again, with younger staff in particular who have these wonderful social networks, both like virtual and meet, you want to draw on that for future recruitment and new readership. Let's move on to talking about leadership and how we lead people. When you're a leader, you're leading a, a team, but you're also leading each individual. And so, for example, a soccer coach does not run a team by getting some people to come and try out and then picking all the best players from the tryouts and then showing them the basics of how to play their position and then being like, OK, see you guys later, and then goes down to the pub and watches the game on TV. Uh, that's not how it works in sport, and it's not how it works here. You need to develop relationships one-on-one -on -one with all of your players and really interact with them individually. This leadership role is really uncomfortable, I think, for a lot of people in the magazine industry and in publishing in general. For myself, I got into this industry because I sort of felt like a bit of a bit of a misfit. I didn't really want to be in like a really corporate environment. I f sort of felt like I was a bit of an outsider. I didn't want to work for the man. Um, and I think a lot of us sort of feel a little bit like that uh, island of misfit toys. And that's sort of what makes our business so weird and, and wonderful and creative and delightful. But it also makes uh, generally really crappy leaders. That might be because a lot of us have never had a good role model as a leader, and it might also be because we're profoundly uncomfortable with the idea of leadership in general. Leadership means being the man. Leadership means telling people like what to do, and it freaks a lot of us out. So there's a fundamental shift that I think we need to make in order to become successful leaders. Because it doesn't matter whether you write stuff down or pick up this handout or I send you, you know, a production schedule on an Excel file or, you know, how to write a good job description. None of that is worth a shit if you're not willing to get comfortable with leading people. This industry is rapidly changing, and if we're not willing to usher in that next generation of excited young people, then we are gonna be a bunch of dead dinosaurs. So it's time, I think, for all of us to, to step into our light a little bit and, uh, and assume that leadership position. When you're coaching individuals, you want to lead them in their growth. You don't want to be a stalker here, but you do want to have that open level of communication with your staff. You want to check in with them frequently. And in the case of new interns, that means daily. You want to sit down with people for five minutes every day, ask them how they're doing, ask them how it's going, what do they need help with, what's interesting about what they're doing, what do they not get at all. New people are terrified to ask questions, so you need to spend a few minutes pulling that out of them. You want to schedule performance reviews. Again, these do not have to be long or complicated. You really want to turn to your intern at this point and ask them uh, what they need from you as well as what you need from them. Again, that sort of idea of checking in daily, you can literally do this with your entire staff if you're a small operation and you'll quickly discover that if people are willing to tell you what problems they face on a daily basis, you might be able to head off some of your production and circulation and, and editorial bottlenecks before they happen. You know, we all have those things that happen, you know, four or six or 12 times a year that make us go crazy and want to pull our hair out. And it's simply because we're not having those communication moments until the problem is, has already arisen and then we're trying to put out a fire. 
give everybody an opportunity to regularly review not only their own personal and professional goals, but also you, what you've set forward as a goal for not only them as an individual in their job description, but also again for the publication in general. So you've got this group of well-coached individuals and now we're coaching the entire team and once again it's communicate, communicate, communicate. I know this seems like a lot of communicating and I know that it is uh, a bit daunting to think about doing all these things. You might not do them all. I hope that you will do some of them uh, and I assure you that doing any of them will reap pretty significant rewards over time. Hopefully most of you are having a per issue post-mortem. Everybody have a, when the issue comes out, you have a post-mortem? Hands way up. Okay, so everybody who doesn't have their hands up, I hope you will start doing that. Bring your people together to have a magazine post-mortem with every single issue. You want people to be excited about the magazine and you wanna talk about the magazine. You wanna sit down, and here's an example, with uh, your entire staff, if possible, and do uh, maybe an editorial run-through. So the, the literal example here is that one magazine I know, the editorial production management and sales staff all get together after after each issue and the editorial staff leads a walkthrough of each story in the magazine. So they talk about interesting things that happened while the story was being written, what they feel the most important aspect of the piece is, uh, what was unique or different about it or the process of putting it together. And the original intent of this process was to arm the salespeople with uh, interesting talking points to uh, help talk to advertisers. But what ended up happening was that communication across the entire magazine improved within departments and uh, from department to department. Everyone had a chance to see opportunities for improvement and they got a lot of ideas for future issues out of these conversations. Uh, everyone felt way more connected to what was being produced. People had a chance to actually find out what everybody else was working on. It's very easy to get in your own personal little silo and now people had an opportunity to be like, oh okay that's what's you know coming up in two months. And fundamentally, at, at, at the very bottom of the whole pile, was making sure that everybody read the damn magazine, because that does not always happen. You know, people say they read it and they kind of get it and they kind of leaf through it. But if you knew that you had to like talk at a short meeting about walking through this and, and have something to say, you would make sure that every single person on your staff actually read the darn magazine. So kind of important. If you're a big organization or bigger, you want to have a town hall meeting once or twice a year. And that's where you would literally bring in, let's say, your board if you had one. People who maybe aren't on the ground uh, every day in the trenches, but have a vested interest in the overall management of the magazine. And those meetings are usually led by the publisher rather than, rather than the editor-in-chief. Uh, and it's meant to update the whole staff on sort of larger uh, business type changes at the magazine. If there are any, what the magazine is doing financially, what the goals are financially for the magazine, and to uh, give people news about maybe great things that are coming and maybe not so great things that are coming in terms of staffing or finances or just any kind of uh, large changes. An open communicative culture uh, like the one I've been describing goes a long way uh, towards heading off conflict before it even happens. People who work as we do in, a, in an environment that is really strapped for time and money and resources, we all get really good at managing a fairly high level of stress a lot of the time. Uh, it's what we do. When your staff and your volunteers feel valued and feel like they're part of a team, they're that much better at handling that level of stress. Whereas if they don't feel valued, if they feel isolated, if they feel ignored, uh, if they don't feel recognized, Recognized, everything ratchets up pretty quickly in terms of uh, unhappiness and intensity. And let's face it, uh, you know, despite your best efforts and the efforts of everyone around you, unless you work at Unicorns and Rainbows Weekly magazine, which really I would I would purchase that magazine. I would be a, I would become a subscriber. Um, that you're never going to create a workplace where everything is you know sunshine and flowers all the time. So when uh, conflict does occur, 
uh, it's very important uh, for, to step back before you get involved and ask yourself a couple of really important questions. The first one being, is this a situational conflict or is this an emotional conflict? Sometimes uh, two people will come to you with what they say is a conflict over you know, a work matter and it actually is a personality clash of some kind. And so you need to assess as best you can whether or not this is an actual problem that you can solve by fixing something in your schedule or in how you do things at work or whether this is something that uh, they're gonna need to learn to play play nicely and navigate. The second question that you need to ask yourself, is this team or group of people or this individual having problems with a task? A lot of times people come to you in an emotional state when there's conflict. And sometimes it's uh, as simple as asking a few questions to dig down and finding out, well, they just get really frustrated because they hit a wall every time they need to, uh, you know, get approval to, to move on with this artwork or they need, you know, there's just a bottleneck or a, a wall that they hit every single time and that frustration comes out as feelings, but it's an actual problem that you can solve. So you want to see if it's a problem that you can solve and see if it's, you know, where the emotions are coming from because then you get to step in and offer guidance or support. When you experience friction with your volunteers or your staff or burnout, you know, a couple times a year, that's, that's normal. That's just a part of what we do. But if you're finding that there's friction or frustration or uh, workplace battles or a lot of burnout, a lot of turnover uh, is an ongoing problem, then chances are uh, it's gonna come back to you. It might have something to do with the way that you're managing your staff. This is a three-way little matrix in a person's ability to do their job and enjoy doing it. So they have, they want, and they need the responsibility to get something done. They have to have some level of responsibility to achieve something. They need to have the authority from above to get that thing done. And lastly, they need the support in place to do that thing. So if someone feels like they don't have the authority to carry out the things that they're responsible for, or if they feel like they have the responsibility and the authority, but they don't have the support. So if you take any one of these things out of this tripod, the whole thing's gonna tip over. You have to invest trust in your junior staff. Uh, if they are responsible for a task, uh, give them the authority to make those decisions and move forward with the work. And then be there to offer support. You can check in periodically, see what they need, but I'm sure almost everyone in this room has had an experience where you've been given responsibility, you've been given direction, you've been given the authority to do it, and yet at every turn, you are thwarted, you are micromanaged, your decision-making is second-guessed by your superior, and you feel like you honestly can't move forward. The, the verbal authority has been given, but the real authority to just go ahead and make some executive decisions on your part has been taken from you. It's enormously frustrating. So if you are guilty of doing this with your staff, uh, know that this is uh, pretty much a fail-proof recipe for disengagement, frustration, and burnout. You are absolutely allowed to step in and offer support, and you are absolutely allowed to step in and direct people if you see things going wildly off the rails. But don't be that big mother hen sitting on every project when you say that you need help and then you refuse to let go and let anybody sit on your egg. Uh, <laughs> Remember that you're not there to mediate a truce. This isn't a brother and sister fighting over Halloween candy. That's not your job. It's your job to protect your workplace and it's your job to protect your organizational mission. And by that, I mean your magazine. So when you're talking with a disgruntled person or you're talking with two uh, upset individuals, you want to make that very clear when you speak to them that your role and you're hoping their role in resolving the conflict is that you're not there to name a winner and a loser, you're there to get both parties or all parties pulling together towards the same goal. Because if things did go 
really sideways and you had to involve a third party at any point, how you act and your behavior towards those people, it will be called into question. So it's very important that you uh, act as the godlike and impartial voice of your publication at that point. Sooner or later, you always have to let people go, whether it's just simply the end of their prescribed tenure with you, or they're moving on to greener pastures. In the case of internships, a lot of times we see people end their internships, and all of that good communication, all of those things that we've set in motion and put into place to support people, to talk to people, to engage with people, just kind of goes like, okay, oh, you're leaving in a week, so I'm just going to stop talking to you and turn over here and talk to these new people over here um, and you don't want that to happen you want to give that communication that support right up until the end and if you're not already doing so I hope that your your uh, corporate culture creates something where uh, there's some kind of formalized send-off for people and you do not have to go crazy and take your entire office out for like a you know binge drinking fest or anything but if your office culture is the kind of place where it's okay to like you know show up on Friday with a couple of beers or a you know thing of cupcakes then then do it uh, it really is again that recognition which is just as important as pay so recognize it's very easy to think uh, of your interns as people who should be a little bit grateful to you for giving them this awesome opportunity with your amazing magazine, but they just did work for you for free. So never forget that that's a two-way street. It's also really good to keep that line of communication open. So if you had a good experience with an intern or a junior staff or even a you know paid staff who's leaving you, always walk them to the door metaphorically and leave that door open a crack because you never know. That person might come back to you pitching stories as a writer. They might come back to you later with a whole new set of skills and experience as a new hire. Uh, and who knows, in this industry, you know, five years from now, they might be your new boss. So leave that door open just a little bit. Thanks so much for coming, and thanks to Magazines West for having me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>